I filed for divorce. A poor wife is useless, after all. My husband suddenly shocked me with these words. Moreover, while I was away on a business trip, not only did he file for divorce, but he also married his lover. Furthermore, my husband said, You, a poor person, married me for my wealth. Right. I won't fall for that, so give up any claim to the property. As if I married him for his money. When I confronted my indifferent husband, who had always treated me like a poor person and scorned me since our marriage, he started to unravel. Ultimately, he spiraled down to rock bottom. My name is Karen, I'm 35 years old. My father passed away when I was in kindergarten, and since then my mother raised me and my sister by herself. I was grateful to my mother, but deep down, I always wished I had a father. Of course, I didn't necessarily want a new father, but I always dreamed of living happily ever after with my husband, surrounded by children. Though I didn't know how many we'd have, life on just my mother's earnings was far from wealthy, but we were happy as a family of three. However, the poverty I grew up with never left me. Even after I started working and earning a decent salary, even when I was single, my grocery shopping at the supermarket centered around discounted items, and I would stock up during sales if the items wouldn't go bad. Eating out was out of the question, and for meals alone, I wouldn't even buy convenience store bento. For drinks, I would bring tea in a thermos. Before I knew it, saving money had become like a hobby of mine. I married my husband John four years ago. We met through an acquaintance and hit it off. Unlike me, who grew up poor, John was wealthy from a young age, and our views on money and values were completely different. However, I was drawn to his kindness and the new world he showed me. We started dating soon after meeting, and as I was over thirty and eager to get married, we tied the knot in less than a year. We decided to move into my apartment, which was close to both our workplaces. It was a company-subsidized apartment, so the rent was quite cheap, one of the reasons we chose it as our new home. After marriage, I continued paying the rent, and John contributed to other living expenses. This was how our married life began. John had a somewhat traditional view of gender roles, believing women should quit their jobs and take care of the home after marriage, and men should support women while women manage the household. I found these views of him cool and masculine at the time. Before our marriage, he suggested I become a homemaker, saying he would support me. He probably thought of me as a domestic woman good at cooking and cleaning, which made me happy at that moment. However, I loved my job and had important responsibilities at work. I didn't hate household chores, but being a full-time homemaker wasn't an option for me. If I quit my job and became a homemaker, we would have to leave this apartment as its company subsidized. Moving to a similar apartment would significantly increase our rent and moving costs. Honestly, John's salary wasn't that high. If we had children, our financial needs would increase, and I would inevitably need to keep working. Thinking about our situation, I decided to earn as much as I could while I could. Since I was paying the rent, I felt I needed to continue earning. I subtly brought up these points, including the need to move out of the apartment, in a conversation with my husband John. This was probably the first time I contradicted his opinions. Hey, about you wanting me to be a homemaker. I'll take care of the house, but can I continue working until we have kids? I want to save as much money as we can for now. Huh? Are you saying my salary isn't enough, or do you just want more money to spend? It's not like that. Kids are expensive, and I want to save up for that. I can even use my earnings for our living expenses. It's better to have more money, right? Right, your annual income is $15,000, right? It's not much, just enough for the rent, but it's better than nothing. It's better than lounging around at home. All right, but don't slack off on the housework. Thank you. 
I'll keep working until we have kids. Of course, I'll take care of the house too. Though I felt uneasy about some parts, I managed to convince him to let me keep working. But in hindsight, this might have upset him. Balancing work and household chores was harder than I expected. My days were incredibly busy. I was a full-time employee, not part-time. I woke up early to prepare breakfast, lunch boxes for both of us, do some prep for dinner, and tidy up the house. When I got home, I prepared dinner, heated the bath, and did laundry after John went to sleep. Honestly, there was barely any time for us as a couple, and I began to wonder if this was really what a marriage should be like. On the other hand, John, who acted like a traditional husband, did absolutely nothing at home. He must have seen how busy I was with household chores, but he would just eat dinner, drink beer, and relax when he got home. He'd bathe alone as soon as it was ready, then go to his room. I wished he would help out a bit, given how hard I was working, but I couldn't say anything, fearing he'd tell me to just quit my job. Despite his lack of help at home, I naively hoped he would change once we had kids. However, our relationship had grown distant, making the prospect of having children unlikely. I decided to discuss it with John. Hey, we should start thinking about having kids, right? Ha, huh, kids? You're quite energetic considering you're tired from work and chores. It's not about that. I want to have children. We haven't been married that long. Isn't it too early for kids? Maybe for you, but I'm already over 30. Women have a limited time to have children. It's getting harder to conceive as I get older. It's almost too late. Then we don't need kids. If we have one, you'll expect me to help, right? You know I'm busy with work. I won't help with child rearing. What? Declaring you won't help with child rearing even before they're born is strange, isn't it? I plan to raise them alone, but shouldn't you at least have the intention to help? It's your child, too. Child rearing is your job. I'm working to support the family, so I definitely won't help with the kids. You'll just complain that I don't help and that you're doing it alone, making me the bad guy. You must have been indoctrinated with poverty and lots of kids since birth. We're not poor. We don't need kids. End of discussion. John abruptly ended the conversation and went to his room. Standing alone in the living room, I was overwhelmed by tears. Not only was my wish for children rejected, but also my upbringing was mocked. Following this incident, our relationship deteriorated rapidly, and we'd hardly spoke any more. There were no children and barely any communication. Maybe it was time to consider divorce, yet a faint image of my once-kind husband lingered in my mind, making me wish we could return to the happy couple we used to be. Since then, I tirelessly juggled work and home responsibilities. I was incredibly busy with various tasks. Eventually, I took on a significant project at work, which meant more business trips and further distance from John. One day, as usual, I told him about an upcoming business trip, but his reaction was unlike any other time. I'll be away on a business trip for about ten days from tomorrow. Please take care. Another trip? You're always working hard. Take care, even though you must be tired. He was unexpectedly kind, unlike his usual mocking self. He even said with a smile, Wait for a big surprise when you get back. I had given up on him and was resolved to a decision internally. However, his smile shook my resolve. Our wedding anniversary was approaching, and I thought maybe he had a surprise for that. Despite everything, I hoped he might have changed his heart. I even considered rethinking my stance if he had truly changed. However, my faint hope was shattered by a major incident. When I returned home ten days later, I faced the first surprise. The front door wouldn't open. The key didn't fit. As I struggled, John spoke from inside. Karen, right? Surprised? 
This is the first surprise. Changed the locks, so your key won't work anymore. What do you mean? Why doesn't my key work? Open the door. Why would I let a stranger into my house? I changed the locks. And for your information, we're divorced. That's the second surprise. A poor wife is useless. Divorce? I never signed any papers. How could you even do this? I just forged your signature. I submitted it with a friend's name as a witness. So you're a stranger now. Got it? Now? Understood. Then we need to discuss property division, right? Right, property division. I have a document for you to sign. I'll let you in this one last time. John finally opened the door. Inside there was a document for me to sign, waiving my rights to property division. I thought you'd say, give me property division if you want a divorce. Poor people like you probably saw me as rich. You married me for my wealth, right? I won't fall for that. So waive your rights to the property. What? I never even thought about property division. I hadn't even considered divorce. So you'll also waive your rights to property division, right? How much property do you think a poor person like you has? A few thousand in savings at most. I don't need that. I have more assets, so if anyone is doing the dividing, it would be me giving money to you, not the other way around. Don't you get it? Is that so? Well, that doesn't matter. Let's change the document to reflect mutual renunciation of property rights and make it a public document, I retorted stubbornly. Afterward, John redid the document on his computer, deciding to make it a public document. However, it would be some time before we could submit it. I decided to pack my things and leave the house for the moment. As I was leaving, he scorned me until the end. You are poor. I thought about throwing away your belongings while you were on your trip, but you barely had anything. Always wearing the same clothes, typical of the poor. The reason my belongings were few at that time was deliberate, part of my plan. The only unexpected thing was John changing the locks without my knowledge. A few days later, as expected, a panicked John called. Karen, what have you done? What do you mean? I haven't done anything. Why are you panicking? I have a lot of questions. First, I was told to leave the apartment. Oh, you were still living there. That's not allowed. It's a new month. You're trespassing. Trespassing? But it's my house. Are you okay? Did you forget that was a company apartment I rented? I was the leaseholder, so naturally, you can't live there anymore. That's ridiculous. How could you do this? I can't believe you didn't know. I'm not the one who should be accused of doing things on my own. Didn't I tell you that you can't just change the locks of a rental apartment? It's my house. I can change the locks if I want. Didn't you listen? It was my leased apartment. Even if you were the leaseholder, the owner is the apartment manager. You can't change the locks without informing them. Is that so? Also, I terminated the lease while you changed the locks. I was allowed to live there until this month. I was planning to return, but now you've unlawfully altered someone else's property, which could be criminal damage. Wait, why did you terminate it so early? Criminal damage? Is that why the police are at the front door now? I'm too scared to open it. But I calmly replied, so the police did come. Don't worry, it's probably not for trespassing or criminal damage. It's better to talk to them. Why do I? I know about the police because I reported you for filing the divorce papers yourself. It seems like you've committed crimes like forgery and fraudulent use of a private document. Divorce papers can be filed by one person, but only with mutual agreement and personal signatures. Since John forged my signature and the witness, 
It's obvious that it's a crime, but he seemed unaware of his guilt. I continued pressing further. So the divorce papers you submitted are invalid, and your marriage with Susan can't happen either. How do you know about Susan? Did you think I knew nothing? I had a private detective agency thoroughly investigate your affair with Susan. It was a busy time at work, and coordinating with the agency was tough. Plus, you even held a grand wedding ceremony while I was supposedly on a business trip. Are you okay? Your business trip was a lie. Yes, I took leave from work despite being busy doing some research and preparing documents. I knew about you bringing Susan home. It would have been impossible to gather this evidence while working. After I revealed everything, John was speechless and seemed quite downcast even over the phone. Then he pleaded with me, Please don't tell Susan I'm divorced. Why would I? There's no such fact to tell. Really? Thank you. Are you misunderstanding something? When did you become divorced? That fake divorce paper is invalid, remember? So legally, you're still my husband, not divorced. What? So since you committed adultery while legally my husband, Susan needs to pay compensation. I sent the demand for reparation to her house yesterday by express delivery. She didn't know you were married, right? Then I can't withdraw the claim at this point. I already knew Susan believed John was single, but I deliberately sent the reparation demand. Susan hasn't contacted me yet, so maybe she hasn't received the letter. It should arrive soon. Should you be on the phone with me when you also have to deal with the police? You're busy. I'll ignore the police. I won't be arrested. I'm going to Susan's house now to get the letter back before she or her family can accept it. He then hung up. He probably went straight to Susan's house to wait for the postman at the front door. I knew it would be futile because the letter was sent as registered mail to Susan only. Even if he waited for the postman, he couldn't receive it. A few hours later, a dispirited John called me. According to him, there was an incident when the postman arrived. Finally, I'll take that envelope. Who are you? You don't live here, right? I'm practically a resident here. Since I'm married, I have the right to receive the mail. I see, but I can't give you this envelope. It's registered mail for Susan only. What? Give it to me? Absolutely not. If you're so eager, ask Susan for permission. What's going on here? Oh, John, what's all this noise? What's happening? Susan, this is registered mail for you. This man insisted on taking it. Sorry for the disturbance. Now, I'll be on my way. What's this? A demand for reparation. John, you were married? What's going on here? Sorry, it's just she's an ex-wife from a long time ago. I was embarrassed to say I'm divorced. I'm sorry for keeping it secret. But it's strange, isn't it? We haven't been dating long, and a demand for reparation. If you were divorced before we started dating, there shouldn't be any problem, right? Well, my ex-wife is crazy. Maybe she's demanding reparation out of spite because I got married. That was the excuse he gave, but such a lie was quickly exposed. The envelope included a letter I wrote along with my contact information, so Susan called me directly. In that call, I told her about the affair, the invalid divorce, and that they had a wedding ceremony while he was still married to me. Although they had a wedding ceremony, they hadn't submitted the marriage registration yet. John wanted to submit it on a good luck day, so it was still pending. He probably delayed submitting the marriage registration due to uncertainty about whether the divorce was finalized. After being exposed, John fled from Susan's house and shamelessly contacted me again. I still had something to tell him, so we agreed to meet at a nearby cafe. As soon as I arrived, John said, Karen, please withdraw the reparation claim. 
Let's pretend we've been separated for a long time and officially divorced now. I can apologize to Susan for being secretly divorced and maybe cover it up. You think I'm desperate to stay married to you? I was going to file for divorce anyway, but since you cheated, you'll pay reparation. Just trying to extort money from me, huh? Typical of the poor. You have such a poor heart. You're talking nonsense. Depending on my answer, everything can change. There's still an option where we don't divorce. If I say no, you can't reject it, meaning you can't marry Susan and your marital status will be exposed. Fine, I'll pay the reparation. Just divorce me now. Sign here then about property division. Property division? How much more do you want to take from me? Reparation should be enough. Remember, we agreed to waive property division, right? So let's make it official. All right, you're not as bad as I thought. Thank you. We then went to a public notary, made a public document for reparation and property division, and then to City Hall to submit the divorce papers, finalizing our divorce. Relieved, I exchanged final words with John. Glad we don't have to divide property. What are you saying? I'm the one who benefits from that. By the way, do you even have assets? After paying me reparation, Susan will also claim damages. She mentioned charging you for the wedding expenses. That's impossible. I'm marrying Susan. She can't claim that. We're divorced now. So, there should be no problem. Still living in a fantasy. You committed marriage fraud. You had a wedding while still married. You think Susan still believes you. Marriage fraud? That's ridiculous. Susan will believe me. Believe that if you want. I heard from Susan directly. Also, weren't the guests at your wedding paid actors? You still owe them. You knew about that? I haven't paid them yet. What does it matter to you? You could have just taken property division and been better off. That's what I wanted to tell you. Even if we had divided property, you would have benefited more. What are you talking about, poor woman? Your family is poor, and you only make $15,000 a year, right? Even if you got a raise, it would be barely $20,000. You don't have any property. You keep calling me poor, so I thought you might be mistaken. Yes, my salary is indeed $15,000, but you know I work for a foreign company, right? It seems you have no interest in me, but I became a director of the American branch. It's not $15,000 per year, but per month. $155,000 per month, so that's an annual income of $1,860,000. You're still bad with numbers. How do you manage to keep a job? It's $180,000 a year. $180,000? That can't be true. Of course, I haven't had the chance to spend such an amount, so I've been saving it for the future. The savings from before our marriage aren't part of the property division, but there's still a considerable amount since our marriage. So I could have received half of that in the property division. You were my destiny after all. I'll get the divorce papers corrected. Are you okay after all the contempt? You think I'd gladly undo the divorce if you have that much money? You don't need to claim reparation, right? It's just a small amount for you. He who laughs at one cent will weep for one cent. This reparation is for the mental anguish you caused me. I'd like to claim more, honestly. And since we've made it official, make sure to pay it, even in installments. I'll be penniless. Also, don't go back to that apartment. Your belongings should have been moved to your parents' house by now. You thought I had few belongings, but that was because I had already moved most of them. Were you that indifferent to me? I can't have so little, so I have to go back to my parents' house. They don't know anything yet, do they? Let me explain. Don't say anything. I'd already told them everything. It's only right to explain why we're divorcing. 
Oh, and your father said don't ever step over our threshold again. So I have nowhere to go. He collapsed, and I left the cafe. Later, I heard he caused trouble at the police station. Despite my advice, he went back to the apartment. He sat there aimlessly in the empty apartment until the manager called the police, and he was taken away. I'm not sure if it was for obstructing public duties, trespassing, or for falsifying divorce papers. Eventually, his parents took responsibility for him. After talking with me and learning about Susan, they decided that apologizing and paying damages to Susan's family came first. They went to Susan's house to apologize, kneeling in front of her family. They settled everything without pressing charges for marriage fraud, even paying for the wedding expenses. I had expected them to sue, so it was disappointing they didn't. So, I decided to pursue legal action against him for forging the divorce papers. John offered a settlement, but I didn't withdraw the lawsuit. I didn't want him to think everything could be solved with money. I wanted him to be convicted and understand the gravity of his actions, even if it cost time and money. I left everything to my lawyer, so it wasn't too burdensome for me. Even though it took time, Jan was exposed for his actions and the marriage fraud at his company. He couldn't stay there anymore. After being detained by the police and subsequently absent without leave, he was eventually fired. He ended up living at his parents' home, working all day at a relative's construction company. His father took all his earnings, leaving him with no income. I thought his parents wouldn't abandon him, but they were stricter than I expected. They paid my reparation and Susan's compensation, planning to make him work like a horse until he repaid everything. He lived in a shed-like place with no electricity, receiving only five dollars per day for food, deducted from his salary. They planned to disown and kick him out once he's repaid everything. A harsh fate. After years of hard work, I was offered a position at the head office abroad, so I moved overseas after the divorce was finalized. I worried John might come to me for help or harbor resentment, but moving abroad alleviated those concerns. I thought work would be my partner for a while, but soon I found a new relationship. I'm now dating a foreign executive at our head office, and I'm pregnant with plans to marry soon. I told him everything about my past and my ex-husband, and he's understanding. I'll take maternity leave and plan to return to work later, supported by him. He's enthusiastic about taking paternity leave and co-parenting, showing a different cultural perspective. After being tormented by my ex-husband, I finally feel I'm grasping true happiness and confidence in building the happy family I always dreamed of. Many suffer due to selfish spouses. While divorce isn't always the right choice, enduring in silence isn't a virtue. It's important to know that honest discussions can lead to resolutions, and sometimes divorce is a necessary option.